All right, hello everybody. Um, we are going to talk about macromolecules today. This is a pretty long presentation, so I'm going to break it up into several videos. Um, this first video, I'm going to introduce you to macromolecules, dehydration synthesis, hydrolysis, and functional groups, and then I'll talk about carbohydrates, and then I'll stop, and the next video we'll pick up with lipids, and then we'll do the same with um, proteins and nucleic acids. Let's go ahead and get started. So we're talking about um, macromolecules. So first of all, I just want to back up and um, give you a little bit of information about carbon and how important carbon is. We said last time that water was really important so that scientists have been thinking that if we're going to find life on another planet, we have to have water. Well, scientists are thinking that actually carbon is super important, even if it's life that doesn't have anything to do with humans, that we're going to need carbon. Um, carbon is abundant on Earth, and scientists have hypothesized that alien life, if it exists, which we don't know, will likely be carbon-based as well. And the question is, why? Well, I'm going to tell you right away because it's a video. Um, it is tetravalent. Do you need to know that word? No, but maybe you can break it down with the prefix. Tetra means four. It can bond with up to four other elements, and that allows enormous molecular diversity. Um, and its covalent bonds are strong and stable. And that is a super important requirement for life. Um, if we're going to base life around a particular molecule, having it based around carbon that's so strong and stable is a great element. So some scientists and the author of this movie and book series called Alien um, have suggested that alien life could be based on the element silicon um, if it were abundant on another planet and carbon was not abundant. Why silicon? Take a look at your periodic table. There's a periodic table over there, but if you can't see it from this far away, um, silicon is right underneath carbon. And what that means is that silicon is also tetravalent. However, silicon's um, electrons are one orbital removed from their nucleus, from its nucleus. And so they're not held on as tightly. So that means that silicon is not as strong and its bonds are not as stable. So pretty much we're thinking carbon has to be what life is going to be based on, even if it's not on this planet, uh, on another planet, it's going to have to have water and it's going to have to have carbon. All right, the next thing I want to introduce you to, I don't think you need to write this down. I just want you to be aware of this experiment. I think this experiment took place in the 1950s. I'm forgetting the date on it, so forgive me on that. Um, basic idea, Miller and Urey wanted to see if the building blocks of life could form randomly just from the chemical reactions that were happening in early Earth's environment. Um, so long story short, they made this apparatus and they added gases in this area, um, the yellow area there, um, that they believed were the gases that were in the primitive atmosphere. Well, we now know that that actually isn't quite accurate. The gases that they added there weren't really what we think the primitive atmosphere would have had at that time. But that's not the point. It's not the point that we're taking from this experiment. They then zapped those gases with electricity to simulate um, lightning. So lightning that might have happened in our primitive planet. And then they collected whatever formed from those interactions. And what they discovered very amazingly was hydrocarbons were forming randomly um, and amino acids were forming randomly. And that was just Wow, that amino acids could form just by random, um, random chemical reactions was fascinating. But let's not go too far with that. Um, first of all, Miller-Urey's experiment did not have the um, chemical or the um, gases quite right in our primitive primitive atmosphere, and the formation of an amino acid is not at all the same as the formation, random formation of a protein. An amino acid has. I'm going to estimate because I don't know the actual number, 10 to 30 atoms in it. Proteins are made of hundreds or thousands of amino acids put together. They didn't find any proteins really um, in this experiment. So it's important that they formed randomly, but we're not talking about forming life randomly. We, we're still scratching our heads trying to figure out exactly how life um, comes about. All right, so now let's actually talk about macromolecules. What exactly is a macromolecule? Well, the prefix macro means big. So we're talking about a large molecule as opposed to micro. Um, proteins at this point are the largest known molecules in the universe, and they happen to be here on planet Earth, and I think that's pretty cool. They tend to be made of just four atoms, four primary atoms, H, O, N, and C. Um, you will find phosphorus in some of them. You will find sulfur in some of them. You'll find selenium in some of them. But for the most part, we're talking about 
about honk. Um, and they accomplish all of life's functions, these macromolecules. Their structure is incredibly important. So we're going to do a lot of looking at structure to make sure we can identify it because that's what determines their function. And then they can be super, super complex like this protein. Just to get a sense, this protein, each one of these little dots, like this little red dot right there, that's one atom. So just get a sense of how super crazy complex this one random protein is. And you have bajillions of proteins just in your body alone. All right, so let's move on and let's talk about the four different types of macromolecules. You should write this part down. This is where you really should be writing. Carbohydrates are the first ones. Um, they are your sugars and your starches. Lipids include your oils and your fats. Proteins um, are proteins. They're made up of amino acids and they're responsible for life functions. So they're the ones that do stuff in your body. They're the ones that have jobs to do. And then the nucleic acids, NA, sound familiar? DNA means deoxyribonucleic acid. That's what DNA stands for. And DNA's job is just to tell your body what proteins to build. And then your proteins are responsible for all your life functions. So they kind of all tie together. Oops. And these are kind of diagrams of um, some of the building blocks. So this is a carbohydrate here. This is a triglyceride, which is a type of lipid. Um, this is an amino acid, which is a building block of a protein. And this is a nucleic, sorry, this is actually a nucleotide, which is a building block of a nucleic acid. So building block of DNA or RNA. All right, so let's talk about building these big molecules. So we're going to talk about the words monomer and polymer. Remember that the prefix mono means one and poly means many. So the monomers are the building blocks. They're the small things, and you put a whole bunch of them together to get the polymers. I often do, um, I often make a comparison to like bricks and a building. Bricks are the monomers. The building is all of those bricks put together, and that's a polymer. So other than the lipids, the other macromolecules have both monomers and polymers. Lipids don't. So the monomer is the simplest unit, and then the polymer is when those all get put together. I just mentioned a moment ago what the monomer was for protein. Who remembers? Amino acid is the monomer of a protein. All right, so this is the formula, sort of. This is just a generalized formula. You put monomer plus monomer, and it says et cetera, because it could be thousands of monomers put together. It depends what you're trying to build. If it's a protein, it's going to be hundreds or thousands of monomers put together to make your polymer. What I want you to especially notice is the arrow is reversible. So you can either be building in complexity or you can be pulling the complexity apart. So it says here, don't write this one down. I would li like you to write down the equation, but you don't need to write this sentence because I'm about to give you two slides that are about this sentence. But it says, the addition or removal of water, and that's called hydrolysis or dehydration synthesis, drives the equation either to the right or to the left. Am I going the right way, right or left? I don't know. My image is reversed on this, so I never know which way to go. Anyway, let's talk about um, which direction we're going. So we're going to talk about dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So I've got two diagrams here. The first one, I put a red box around. That's dehydration synthesis. So I want you to just study it for a second. What we've got are two building blocks. These are two monomers. In this case, they're called monosaccharides, if I was going to be real specific. And they are being joined together. We're adding them together to make a larger molecule. But what I really want you to notice is why it's called dehydration. We are removing water from the monomers, and then that allows the monomers to uh, be attracted to each other and to bond with each other. And then we're left with a molecule of water that goes away. So that's called dehydration. And then synthesis means you're building something or you're making something. If you're going to synthesize something, you're building it. So it builds more complex molecules like polymers by removing two hydrogens and one oxygen. Water forms. It's called dehydration synthesis because you're removing water from the beginning. It's left over at the ending. Water forms. It is anabolic. You don't really need to know that word yet, but it will come up a little bit later in the um, in this curriculum. So anabolic just means it's it's building in complexity. They're getting, they're, the molecules are getting more and more complex. And it's endergonic, which means that it requires energy. This dehydration process, you need to add energy in in order to build a more complex molecule. Now, I want you to think about the next slide, which is on hydrolysis. You're adding water, you're um, 
building or you're lessening complexity, you're losing complexity, and it doesn't require energy. It's all exactly the opposite. Um, and before I forget, um, all of these processes require enzymes. And you don't know a whole lot about enzymes yet. And we're actually going to learn about enzymes in the next unit, which is on cells. Um, but enzymes are proteins. They have a very, very specific shape. All proteins do, but enzymes also have a very specific shape. And that shape fits onto molecules and either puts them together and builds them or it pulls them apart. And so enzymes are required for all of these reactions to happen efficiently. They could theoretically bump into each other and water could go away and you might get, um, but it's not going to happen at the speed that biological systems need it to happen without enzymes. All right, so hydrolysis is the reverse. It's the reverse of dehydration. Um, lysis means to break up. So hydrolysis, using water to break up the molecules. So in this case, look at down here where it says hydrolysis. We're adding water, and that's causing the um, disaccharide, the polymer, to break up into two monosaccharides. So water was added. It is a catabolic, not an anabolic process because it reduces complexity. And then it is exergonic. It releases energy when that molecule gets broken up. And it, it of course, requires enzymes. All of these reactions always require enzymes. All right, next, I want you to write down um, our seven um, functional groups that are going to be super important in these biological molecules. Um, all I need you really to write down is the name and the shape. So I want you to write, I make a little table and write hydroxyl and then write OH. So it's a dash, that's the bond, and then an O, and then it, there's actually a bond between the H and the O also, so that the oxygen has two bonds and it's bonded to one hydrogen. Um, they always abbreviate it by showing no bond, but there is a bond there. Okay, so write hydroxyl and then write OH. Carbonyl or carbonyl is a C double bonded to an O. It is very similar to the next one, the carboxyl group. The carboxyl group is a C double bonded to an O, but then the C is also bonded to an OH, a hydroxide or hydroxyl group, and that's called the carboxyl group. Um, I will mention that sometimes that group is called the carboxylic acid group, um, and that is partly where the name um, amino acid or fatty acid comes from. We'll get to that a little bit later, but just be aware of that. The amino group, I always emphasize that, is one of the only groups that has an N in it, has a nitrogen. And obviously, you're going to find that in amino acids. The sulfhydro group is an S and an H. Um, and so that's um, one of the few sulfurs that we're going to see in our biological systems. The um, second to last one is phosphate group, and that's phosphorus surrounded by four oxygens. Um, and we're going to see phosphate in um, DNA and RNA. We're going to see that quite a bit. And then the last group, um, last functional group that we're going to be talking about is the methyl group. Um, you might remember the name methane um, from when we were naming, naming hydrocarbons. Meth means one carbon. So methyl is one carbon surrounded by three hydrogens, and then it's bonded to something else. All right, that's all you need to know about those. You can always go back and see them and read through this um, just to be aware of the stuff. But um, if you know what they look like, you're going to be good to go. All right, finally, we get to jump into carbohydrates. So let's talk about carbohydrates. Um, once again, we mentioned this earlier, the carbohydrates are the sugars and the starches. They are made of just three elements. There's no nitrogen, there's no phosphorus, there's no sulfur, there's no nothing else, just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And that's where the name carbohydrate comes from. The monomers, remember the monomer is the building block, they always have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a one to two to one ratio. Um, the carbohydrates are used for short-term energy storage and structure. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, and carbohydrate monomers are called monosaccharides. Saccharide means sugar and mono means one. So they are simple sugars or the single sugars. And then you see some examples of carbohydrates there. So let's talk about the monosaccharides first. These are the major carbs used for quick energy. This is your um, mitochondria, if you remember that from junior high. The mitochondria is what makes your energy, your ATP. And your mitochondria use monosaccharides, in particular glucose, to build your energy. So if you've got glucose in your bloodstream, your um, mitochondria are able to quickly make your ATP and give you a good burst of energy. 
So now you need to study these diagrams a little bit carefully. Um, look at the difference between the three of them. They are all C6H12O6. What, KJ? I don't understand. How can fructose and glucose be C6H12O6? They're different shapes. I don't understand. Well, if you number the carbons, which you're supposed to, um, you can count that they have six carbons. So remember that each vertex, there's a good word, each vertex that doesn't have anything there, anything written, that's a carbon. So look at where my arrow is. There's a carbon here. That's one, two, three, four, five, and then the last carbon is up here, six. So it has six carbons. If you count all the O's and the H's, um, it's C6H12O6. Now let's look at fructose and show ourselves that that's the same. Here's the first carbon. Here's carbon number one. One, two, three, four, five, and there's the sixth carbon. So it is C6H12O6. It's just got a different shape. So, and that makes them have a different flavor, which we'll talk about soon. But the shape of a molecule determines what flavor it has. Um, so fructose and glucose don't taste the same. Now here's another puzzling one. Why are galactose and glucose different? Because they have the same shape. I don't see what the difference is. Take a minute and see if you can figure out the difference. Feel free to pause me and see if you can figure out the difference. So I put a little note here and now I can't, I don't know if you can see it. It's behind the little thing on my screen, but it says isomers are molecules with the same formula, but different structures or arrangements of atoms. So just to give you an idea of why that would matter, remember that I said earlier, enzymes have a very specific shape. All proteins have a very specific shape. And if you change the shape of the molecule that it's going to be um, working with, it won't work anymore. So if we have a glucose versus a fructose, you need a different enzyme. It's not going to work right um, if you have the wrong enzyme. And so that totally impacts your body, your ability to digest things, um, your ability to build things, make larger molecules, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what was the difference? Did you figure it out? The difference between glucose and galactose? It is very, very subtle. Oh, sorry, I just noticed that popped up. Hexose are six carbon sugars, and these are the ones that are really well known, and you really should know them. Um, it's not that you need to be able to draw every little detail, but you should be familiar with glucose, fructose, and galactose as the monosaccharides, and they're called hexoses because they all have six carbons. That wasn't supposed to pop up then. Oh, well. So what I did down at the bottom is I took these, we call them ring structures when they make a hexagon or a pentagon, and I pulled them apart like this to show you the linear, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But now we can compare, oh, I grabbed the wrong one, never mind. I wanted to compare galactose and glucose, and I com am comparing D-glucose and L-glucose, never mind. If you pull them apart, you will see that glucose and galactose have one hydrogen and hydroxide group that are swapped. I grabbed the wrong one. Ah, video, is this so fun? Moving on. Pretend I didn't do that. I'll change, change it as soon as I think of it. All right, and then I just wanted to show this. This is not at all important, but just wanted your eyeballs to get trained what you're seeing. So what we have been looking at is the ring structure, what letter C is right now. But it is possible for those rings to be pulled apart and to make a line, a linear version of the um, monosaccharide, or they can come together to make that ring structure. So it says by reacting the OH, the hydroxide group, on the fifth carbon atom with the carbonyl group, the cyclic monosaccharide is produced. So here's the linear version. Here's the fifth carbon and the carbonyl group. There they are coming together. And it releases, um, it releases one hydrogen, this hydrogen right here, I, I believe it's this hydrogen right there, gets released. Um, but then they come together and they make a cyclic version of it. Um, so the linear and the cyclic, basically the same molecule, but a different shape. And so does that mean it tastes different? All right, disaccharides are next. We just did monosaccharides. Disaccharides are next. Di, the prefix di means two. So we're going to put two monosaccharides together to make a disaccharide. We're building in complexity. That would make it anabolic. Um, and so we have to do dehydration synthesis. So if I showed you the whole reaction, you would see a monosaccharide plus a monosaccharide making sucrose. And then a monosaccharide. So And it even tells you the names of the monosaccharides. So sucrose, which is table sugar, 
um, is made from glucose and fructose put together. There's the um, hexagon and the pentagon. Lactose, which some of you are lactose intolerant, is made from galactose and glucose being put together. And that makes the sugar that's found in milk products. And then maltose, yep, it's malt sugar, um, is made from two glucose molecules put together. So during dehydration synthesis, water is removed and they stick together and make that disaccharide. So this is what the dehydration synthesis reactions look like. Here's the two monosaccharides, glucose plus fructose. There's water being removed. Notice the water is written in red to make it stand out to your eyeballs. And now they're joined together with this. This is called a glycosidic linkage. You don't necessarily need to know it's a glycosidic linkage, um, but when we talk about steroids, it's going to be helpful to notice that little link between the um, between the two monosaccharides to build the disaccharide. All right, the last section that we're going to talk about are the polysaccharides. This is our polymer. Um, they can be enormous molecules, and they're for short-term energy storage. And I mean short-term. Long-term energy storage, we're going to use lipids for. Short-term energy storage is what plants and animals use uh, polysaccharides for. So the, we're going to talk about three of them. There are three that you definitely need to know. The first one is called starch. Um, the more technical name is amylose, um, and it's made by plants and it is unbranching and alpha-linked glucose polymers. So look at what starch is. It's actually pretty brilliant. Remember that your mitochondria needs glucose. So starch is glucose, 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 glucose. glucose. So starch is a really high energy molecules, and it just takes time for your body to pluck off each of those glucose molecules, but you get a lot of energy from starch. It just takes some time for your enzymes to pull them apart. Glycogen, I accidentally clicked ahead here. Glycogen is also a polymer of glucose, um, but notice that this one branches. It's found in animals, and instead of just being one long straight line, it's got branches that come out of it, and that's called glycogen. The last one that you definitely need to know is cellulose. Cellulose is for structural support. It's the major component of plant cell walls. It's also, it's also in fungi, I think, but don't quote me on that. Um, it is unbranching like cellulose. I mean, sorry, like starch was, but this one is beta linked instead of alpha linked. What? Let's compare them. So down below is starch and up above is cellulose. Look carefully at the difference between the two molecules. Both of them are glucose, monomer after monomer after monomer after monomer. They're all linked together to make a polymer. But in the cellulose, each glucose is flipping upside down. One time it's right side up, the next time it's upside down. One time it's right side up, the next time it's upside down. That's called a beta linkage. For the starch, all of the glucose molecules are right side up. There's no upside down or right side up, but just go with me. Um, here's the irony. You have the enzyme for breaking apart starch. All of the glucose molecules upright, your enzyme fits right onto that and breaks it apart and you can get tons of energy from starch. But cellulose, because the monomers are flipping backwards and forwards, your enzyme doesn't fit with them. So cellulose is like grass and leaves. If you possess the enzyme that fit with the beta linkage, you would be able to get all the energy you wanted. I'm not saying it would be yummy, but think about what we could do for human hunger if people could eat grass and leaves. Um, and we can't because we don't have that enzyme. We are enzyme deficient. So this is our last page that we're going to talk about, and it's called the problem of herbivory, which means it's really hard to be an herbivore because herbivores, for the most part, don't possess the enzyme either. So this is what it says. Humans and most other animals possess the enzyme for digesting starch. However, the beta linkages found in cellulose do not fit with that enzyme. So cellulose is largely indigestible. It makes us feel crappy. When your doggy eats grass, what does it do? Lots of times it pukes it up. Um, so to make eating plants work, there are a few solutions. Number one, termites have a symbiotic protist. So that's a little microscopic organism that does possess the correct enzyme. So that's why um, termites can eat stuff that we cannot. Cows have a symbiotic bacteria that does have the correct enzyme and they chew and regurgitate and chew. So they chew 
they swallow, they barf back into their mouths, they regurgitate, they chew some more, they swallow, they barf back into their mouths, they chew some more. That process of chewing is manually ripping the glucose molecules off of the cellulose. They chew and chew and chew and chew. You and I chew a few times and we swallow. Cows chew and chew and chew till the cows come home. Oh. Okay. Um, and so that allows them to break down their cell walls, both the bacteria helping them and them regurgitating. The last one that's really lovely are the cecophores, like bunny rabbits. Um, cecophores eat their poo. Yeah, really. There's a special kind of poo that's called cecal pellets. Um, and the cecal pellets have a lot of cellulose in them. And so the rabbits will poop it out and then they'll turn around and nibble on it and chew it some more. And they pass it back through their digestive system again. And that that continual processing through their digestive system and the chewing of it um, allows them to eat cellulose. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are done with carbohydrates. We'll do a different video for lipids. Have a great one.